Before I get started, I want you to listen to something that I recorded. Even if you're listening on laptop speakers or even a phone, maybe you probably heard the difference between those two tracks quite clearly. And I'll explain to you how I came to record them. Recently, I made some changes to my 10 channel amp. I made a video, my last video actually, talking about those changes. And when I brought it down to hook it up again, I immediately ran some measurements just to make sure everything was connected correctly inside. I didn't want, you know, problems. So I did that. And while I was doing it, I also checked my side speakers to make sure they were lined up properly. They got moved around a little bit. I realigned those. And I also tested for the first time the speakers that I have set up in the back in the Hafler circuit. And those speakers are powered by my Yamaha home theater receiver. And that receiver has different presets. It adds effects or it can to the sound. And I tried various combinations. All the while, still running the measurements just to see what the effect would be. And the two settings that I recorded using my lavalier microphone right here, standing in the same position in the room, which is directly behind my listening position, were direct stereo, just no effects whatsoever. So a straight stereo going to the speakers. Of course, the Hafler takes the, the difference of those two channels and it outputs that. And in the second recorded sample, I had the receiver set to concert hall as an effect, and that adds reverb to the sound. And like I said, you can easily hear that extra reverb in the recording. But the interesting thing is that it really didn't show up in the measurements that I made. The first one you're looking at here is the first recorded sample, and that's with the receiver set to two channel stereo. And the only thing that stands out in this measurement is that hump that you see at 850 hertz. I later repositioned the back speakers and flattened that out. It, was, it had to do with where they were positioned and how they were pointed at the listening position. This frequency plot that you're looking at now is the recording with the reverb switched on, the concert hall effect switched in. And you can see that there's virtually no difference between the frequency response from one sample to the other, even though they sound quite different. And to show that more clearly, here they are laid on top of each other. And you can see that there's very little difference between the two measurements. And those measurements were taken from exactly the same position. I never removed the mic. I never changed levels. I didn't do anything differently. The mic stayed exactly where it was. The measurements are not gated. They're straight from the speakers and into the room and into the microphone at my listening position. So nothing changed in that regard. The only thing that changed was adding reverb quite a bit to that second sample. So if you're just looking at frequency response, either on axis, off axis, whatever, on gated, gated, it's not going to show that difference. That's going to be something that you can say you hear, but it's not measured, but you can see the effect if you look at another measurement. So this next plot shows a waterfall plot of the first sample. And what a waterfall plot shows is decay time for the signal. You can see the ridge up at the top that represents the frequency response. And then the sloping side of it represents how long it takes for that signal to die out. And we can see that everything above 100 hertz is dying out really quickly. Now, when we look at the waterfall plot for the second sample, you can see that above 100 hertz, things are hanging around a lot longer. And this is where you're going to see what you heard in the recorded sample. You're not going to see it in the frequency response, but you are going to see it in the time response. That's why time response measurements in the room in particular are very important. They tell the rest of the story. Frequency response will tell you one component, but it's a very, you know, limited factor. 
in what's going on, this can tell you most of the rest of the story. Another way of showing that decay time is with the spectrograph, and here I have it set for the first sample, and you can see how even and straight and flat it is. It's in between 150 milliseconds to 250 milliseconds. And then when we look at the one for sample B, you can see how much longer everything is hanging around, especially in between 300 hertz and 10K. Something else you can look at is the impulse response from both samples. And here I've got the first one for the one where there's no reverb. And here's the one that has all of the reverb. And once again, you're not gonna see the difference here. The difference is too small. So in conclusion, if you're thinking that not everything we hear can be measured, that's not entirely accurate, but you have to look at every aspect of it in what you can measure, okay? If sound is being produced, it can be measured and it can be looked at and should be looked at in all of the ways that are important overall. You can't just focus on one specific part of it because you may not see a difference when a real difference is actually there and you will actually hear a real difference.